I am in Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas at the bedside of Governor John Connolly, where he is recovering from his wounds. Governor Connolly, what are your recollections of those terrible moments when you and President Kennedy were shot? Martin, just before it occurred, of course, uh, we'd had a great morning in Fort Worth, a magnificent breakfast. Uh, we spoke in a slight drizzle. We made a trip to Dallas, uh, huge throngs along the way. We got into downtown Dallas with a tremendous crowd, real warmth, uh, real understanding, real appreciation. And Nellie and I saw it so vividly because we were riding in the car with them. Uh, we did not attempt to acknowledge the obvious ovation that they were getting because we, we knew it was for the Kennedys. Uh, the reception had been magnificent. Uh, the president had remarked on it, uh, so had Miss Kennedy. As a matter of fact, I guess not 30 seconds uh, before the tragic incident occurred, that Nellie had turned to the president and said, Mr. President, uh, they can't make you believe now that uh, there are not some in Dallas who love you and appreciate you, can they? And he said, no, they sure can't. And then, and then we had just turned the corner. We heard a shot. I turned to my left. I was sitting in the jump seat. I turned to my left to look in the back seat. The president had slumped. Uh, he had said nothing. Almost simultaneously, as I turned, I was hit. And I knew I'd been hit badly. And uh, I said, I knew the president had been hit, and I said, my God, they're going to kill us all. And then there was a third shot, and the president was hit again. And we, we thought then very seriously. I had still regained consciousness, but the president had, been, had slumped in Miss Kennedy's lap. And when he was hit the second time, she said, or the, or the first time, I, it, it all happened in such a brief span, she said, uh, oh my God, they killed my husband. She said, Jack, Jack. And, uh, and then after the third shot, uh, the next thing that occurred, I was conscious, the Secret Service man, of course, the chauffeur had, they had pulled out of the line. They said, uh, get out of here on the radios. They said, get us to a hospital immediately. And so we pulled out, of course, and immediately fast as we could go and got to the hospital and it, it, uh, in the space of a, a few seconds it's unbelievable what can happen Martin we went from great joy anticipation uh, wonderful crowds wonderful throngs to great tragedy governor what are the thoughts that have come to you as you've lain here in this hospital bed recovering from your wounds oh Martin there have been there have been many and, and many subjects. And I just wonder, you wonder all types of things. You wonder why his life was taken, why my life was spared. Uh, and I know, of course, that some now speculate that, well, it was me the man was after, not him. Of course, I have been campaigning all over Texas uh, all last year for 11 months. All this year, riding parades, horseback, in cars, open cars, on street corners. I could have been in, uh, an easy prey for anyone with no security, whatever. So uh, I don't place any, uh, any stead in this, except I think the man did what he intended to do. To shoot both of us. And uh, that's the only thing I can think. What other reflections have you had, Governor? Only that maybe, uh, uh, Martin, that... The President of the United States, as a result of this great tragedy, has been asked to do something in death that he couldn't do in life. And that is to so shock and so stun a nation and the people and the world of what's happening to us, of the cancerous growth that's being permitted to expand and enlarge itself on the community and the society in which we live that breeds a hatred, a bigotry, an intolerance, an indifference, a, a lawlessness uh, that is, I think, an, really an outward manifestation of what occurred here in Dallas. It could have occurred in any, any other city in America. It is nothing more than a manifestation of an extremism 
on both sides. That basically is the genesis of our self-destruction if we're ever going to be destroyed. I am not the least fearful of any foreign enemy as so long as we have within ourselves uh, not hate but human understanding, not passion and prejudice, but reason and tolerance, and not ignorance, but knowledge, and the willingness to use that knowledge. This is the only answer I can give Martin why he's gone and I'm not. Governor, when did they tell you that President Kennedy was dead? They told me uh, Saturday, uh, after I was conscious enough really to understand. Uh, it was no news, Nellie told me. And uh, it was no news to me though, because uh, I was almost sure that, that uh, he would be after the two shots that I felt he'd taken. I, hope, I hoped, as everyone else did, of course, and I hoped longer than most because uh, I did not know uh, until long after most people knew uh, that he had succumbed. Uh, because I personally felt that that I had been killed too when I received my shot. Yes. What were your first conscious thoughts about the president's death? Martin, my really uh, first conscious thoughts are still my same conscious thoughts. Just, my God, uh, what a horrible, horrible tragedy and uh, how in the space of a fleeting moment uh, things can change. Only before, uh, here were two relatively young men, we were almost identical age, riding with what I would like to believe two of the most beautiful wives in this country. We'd been together for 24 hours. They were happy, we were their host, we were proud to be their host in Texas, they had a tremendous welcome in San Antonio, in Houston, in Fort Worth, in Dallas. And then in a matter of a few seconds, uh, this incident occurred that changed all our lives, changed the course of history for many people in what many divergent ways you never know. And it uh, makes you reflect, ponder, wonder uh, if you do all that you ought to do uh, day by day and trying to make whatever contribution you can uh, to the society in which you live because you never know when your day may come. Governor, many Americans feel that we should have a memorial to the president. Have you thought about that? What kind? Martin, I would, I would most certainly think we ought to have a memorial to the president. I don't know what kind, it could be any kind, it could be marble, it could be granite, it could be stone, but really uh, I would hope that if the American people build a monument uh, to President Kennedy, that they not do it uh, in a sense of absolving themselves uh, of the sins, which I think we all must suffer. Uh, for a lack of tolerance, a lack of understanding uh, for the prejudice, the passion, the hate, and the bigotry that permeates this whole society in which we live, that I think manifested itself here on Saturday. I, I think this was only one, uh, one facet of it. We see it in the bombings of, of five little children, five little girls in Birmingham. Uh, it, it happens elsewhere in the United States. Uh, we, we, I think, above all else, if we erect such a monument, we ought to erect it as a monument to patience, to tolerance, to knowledge, to human understanding, to human dignity, freedom of the individual, and society uh, that lives under law and under God, and where each can respect each other, notwithstanding that they disagree with them, because we have permitted uh, uh, the circumstances to occur in this country where fanaticism 
uh, and extremism uh, has become a, a fad, a fashionable fad. And this has to be destroyed. The people of reason, the people of logic, the people of intelligence are going to have to emerge. They're the people who are the silent people. They're the people who are not speaking. And their voice is going to have to become the dominant voice of this country. John Fitzgerald Kennedy himself, Governor, was deeply conscious of exactly what you say and addressed himself to it. People. Governor, you point out the, the way the fate intervened to literally change the world in this moment. One way that it has changed the world is it's given the United States for the first time in our history a president from your state of Texas. I know I how close that. you are to... I thought about that, Martin. Uh, I've been very close to the president, as you know. Uh, I first went to work for him in 1938. Uh, I worked for him again in 1949. We served in the uniform of the Navy as did President Kennedy. The president Johnson and I were actually serving together in the Navy during the war. And I thought, how ironic that in spite of the fact that I've managed his campaign unsuccessfully before the presidency, that uh, uh, the man who defeated him, President Kennedy, named me Secretary of the Navy, a highly treasured position so far as I was concerned. And then on the very day uh, that the president was assassinated and that I was wounded, result of that was that Mr. Johnson became the President of the United States. And a rather strange uh, set of circumstances. Tell us something about Lyndon Baines Johnson, Governor. Martin, he is a person of many complexities, really. Uh, he is a person who will be viewed by some as being perhaps uh, unlettered, uh, and in some ways he is unlettered. Uh, but in other ways, uh, uh, he's probably as, as literate a person as you'll ever see in your life. As literate in terms of the understanding of human nature. He will not be the, the most well-read person you will ever know. But he will have a human instinct that I think will almost surpass any other person that you'll ever encounter. Uh, he is a person of great charm, of great poise at times, and yet uh, at times he can be almost uh, brusque and rude. Uh, always determined, always firm, always a man of his convictions, uh, an indomitable and indefatigable worker. Uh, working uh, always for perfection. Uh, wouldn't you say that's a, a pretty good analysis of him, sweetheart? Uh, those are the qualities that I would offhand think of, Martin, that I would point out first. Uh, I think, uh, naturally, since he is now the President of the United States, that I should also point out that I think it can be fairly said that no man uh, ever really assumed the burdens of that office in many ways better equipped than he and that'll come as a strange statement uh, i'm sure to some people in this country but uh he's uh i guess 55 now he? eight years over now he's 55 uh he was born in a rugged country of rugged parents uh, so many hard times, uh, they can be even, uh, I would say, poverty-stricken times. The days of his schoolings were arduous. Uh, he did it himself. He pulled himself up by his own bootstraps. Uh, he's worked with people uh, of many nationalities, of many languages, of many economic uh, views, and uh, many economic levels. I think he understands uh, the heartbeat of, of this nation. 
probably as well as any man has ever been president of the United States. Uh, he's, been a, he's been a laborer, and not just to be one to say he'd been one, but because he had to be one. Uh, he's been a school teacher, and he knows uh, what it is to teach school in a country school, teaching a bunch of Latin students at Catula, Texas. Uh, he headed the NYA, Martin, uh, when he was 26 years old. National Youth Administration. National Youth Administration, Roosevelt. you remember, on the Roosevelt days. And uh, he was the youngest NYA administrator in the country. I think by any standards, did is one of, one of the finest jobs in the United States. There he worked again with young people, saw the, the need for education. Uh, he, he has, again, this, this concept of the needs of youth and what it means and uh, what contribution you can make to young minds and what those young minds can contribute to the welfare of this nation. He's walked among the great and the near great, as you well know. Yet I don't think it has ever changed him in the least. I think he still has the rough, uh, the rough hewn, the rough exterior of the hill country from which he came and which he loves. Uh, I think he's as, uh, in many ways as readable as uh, an open book. Yet again, a, a very complex person. I think for the, for the sake of this nation, I want to repeat uh, two things that I said about him. The first, he is very firm. He's very determined. And I think in uh, our dealings with uh, foreign nations, I know of no man in my lifetime that I would rather be dealing with my hand Governor, I don't want to tax your strength any further. I just want to thank you for a really Martin, memorable. You were wonderful to come. Uh, I, I hope you understand this is the first uh, uh, moment that I have had to uh, say anything or to express anything. Uh, we have Nellie expressed our mutual concern to Ms. Kennedy in a handwritten note that our son John took and delivered to her at the funeral ceremonies in Washington on Monday. But I'm grateful to you for your being here, uh, and I'm, I'm just thankful I can see you again. Thank you, Governor, and I'm so glad you're all right. And may I say to you, Mrs. Connolly, that I want you to know how all through the nation Everyone admires the grace and the courage of which you conducted yourself in a terrible moment. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That's the conclusion of the interview with Governor John Connolly at his bedside in the Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas, where the governor is recovering from the wound suffered in the attack by an assassin on himself and the President of the United States.